must know the rule of the game. Otherwise, don't enter into the game. Another important thing is anybody, whether you are doing a research on human or you are doing research in a volunteer, whether you are doing research which is say, what is called as an academic research or whether you are doing research on a new drug efficacy and safety finding out, that is a regulatory, you have to have the ethics permission. Now, this ethics permission can be of two types. One, it, it can be if it is an observational history or academic trial, this has to be ethics committee, which is to be approved by, by ICMR or DHR, or if it is a new drug, it has to be approved by CDSCO. The bottom line is that each investigator signs one certificate before he enters into clinical trial and that sign certificate is that this study will be conducted under gcp are yaar gcp to humne likh diya humne form pucha gcp hai kya to 90% log kehte hain gcp sir i know gcp what is gcp people say is a good clinical practice i said don't tell me the abbreviation of good clinical practice. Everybody knows that this is GCP. What is the philosophy of this? What is the principle of this? And that is the first thing which a person has to sign that the study is done under GCP. And the bottom line of GCP is are as follows. You know the rules and regulations of the clinical research, clinical trial of your country of that country where you are doing it, if you are doing a multinational country, then you have to have the regulations of other part of the world as well. Number two, that you have to know what is the ethics. And number three, that you have to know what are the benefits, risks versus the, the study. If you want to know all those things, what is the role, responsibility of the sponsor, role, responsibility of the investigator, role, responsibility of the ethics committee, and how if a person dies during clinical trial, what is the causality assessment, and who will assess the compensation, who will give the compensation, how they will give the compensation, in what time this compensation will give them, and so on and so forth. You sign a certificate for this. But many times what has been seen that we do not know what you have signed. And therefore you are likely to commit mistakes. And if caught, you will be punished. But your getting punishment is less important than prevention of the serious side effects to the patient or the volunteer. And therefore... What has been important that the government of India decided once that all the ethics committees, all the sites, all the investigators must be audited. It's a difficult process. A lot of uh, logistic issues. And therefore, what we have decided that we must create a system by which we can train adequately and certify adequately and valid certification to those who are investigators or also those who provided tests or certification. It has been seen that when this rule was implemented, hundreds of training institutions on GCP came to the surface. And they started giving training to MD, MS, new investigators, whether the adequately subjects were covered or not, whether the training was adequately imparted or not, maybe in one hour or two hours, maybe just one day, six days, or some were giving for a month, whether there was an online situation or there was an offline also experimentation. Now, this resulted into a total disharmony in the training module which was given to the so-called our potential research people. People got certification just after attending one hour session on GCP. 
and one hour session on gcp by those who attended previous month he is now the speaker a one month old person old means the one month senior person in gcp is giving talk and then he is giving distribution certificate this resulted into chaos any everybody and everybody started giving certificate varying from one hour to one day to seven days to three months and there are courses which are there for two years maybe on every saturday and sunday so the government decided and we decided that we create a body which will ensure that this is the adequate amount of training which is required this is the optimum tool which is validated which must be trained this is the faculty which is known expert in the country who will train and then also this training manual will also be validated evaluated and the person who has been trained on this is also evaluated evaluated and then we finally gives a certification that is what the quality council of india does uci now therefore this program is to sensitize the entire gamut of uh, such clinical researchers that a be careful of such unscrupulous training centers faculty and all that who give you training neither of which is a, is a standardized updated or actual sometimes even to that extent because many times whims is comes up. and therefore this organization gcp cps is that personal certification you appear to this body which is department of science and technology and then they will do the syllabus is, is uniform validated the person who is going to talk on the subject is an expertise and has a caliber as certified in cv and also certified by the board then they deliver a talk which may be interactive which may be hands on and then this council will assure that you got the adequate training so that is the certification now this certification is now will be valid globally not only in india because this is an iso certified also this body also gives certification to the institutional ethics committee or training centers which adhere to the norms and syllabus and the criteria of this body and then impart a training however the assessment of this training will be done by this body and if they found adequately suitable then they will be given yes are entitled to get this certification i think that is what the purpose of this entire the system which we are created in thsti which is the government of india department of biotechnology body and our objective is that maybe soon we will create a minimum uh, trained staff nurses or the stakeholders who will be well trained certified and our clinical trial will be much much valued in the world over thank you very much dr sits the wonderful uh, initiative and i compliment all those in qci and in department of science and technology thank you thank you so much sir um, for sparing your valuable time i know that you are in middle of something but you always take out time for strengthening this and that's that we believe is in strength because the technical uh, background of clinical research is lies in its strength and in gcp pcs is married between the technicalities of gcp and the quality aspects of the pcs thank you so much once again if it is possible around 4:30 if you can make it during the question answer sessions we'll be very happy thank you so much so ladies and gentlemen i'll just give you a very quick round of uh, run to understand what it is uh, if you have undergone earlier one then it will be a revision for you but if you haven't then this is this will be a <clears throat> just a mere introduction about this 
Uh, GCP PCS is born out of our pure passion for excellence. Long ago, when we were conducting GCP uh, training programs, I was very uh, astonished that there is no certification scheme for getting GCP. That time, our executive director, Professor Gagandeep Kang, wanted us to get the best kind of GCP training course done. And I went to Quality Council of India seeking the help. And that was the birth of GCP PCS. I'd like to thank Professor Kang for supporting this initiative initially, which was very, very essential. And all the executive directors, Professor Pramod Garg, as well as present Professor, Professor Jointa Bhattacharya for their strong support. All of you who are attending this, I'm sure are about aware about GCP. It's an international standard, which is both ethical and scientific standard, which is a quality standard, which ensures that whenever we do any clinical research or trial, how was it designed? How was it conducted? How is it recorded? How is it reported? Many times when I do conduct uh, assessments for an APH or WHO SITKAR for CAP, for the ethics committees, I find that they come out with a GCP certificate, which is online from some global health or from NIDA. I have nothing against them. The only thing is that these GCPA certificates are not valid in India. As rightly said by Professor Y.K. Gupta ji, that uh, whatever is our rules and regulations, our traffic signals rules, we drive right or we drive left, the, or the country decides. So we have NDCT rules, which he chaired as the committee, which drafted this new drugs and clinical trial rules. And this NDCT mentions that the GCP, which is by the uh, CDSCO, is the one which we should be following. But none NIDA or Global Health never uses this GCP. So it is very imperative for us that we understand and follow something which is our country's rules and regulations. If we ask, is GCP compliance necessary? It's absolutely mandatory without that. You can't be touching patients or you should not never divulge into clinical research or trials. It's a mandatory requirements and in NDCT rules, it has been very, very clearly mentioned that ethics committee member will be disqualified if they do not possess it. And that's the biggest problem nowadays that anybody is now training GCP and we do not know whether that person who is training also is having those knowledge of GCP. And that's why this uniformity of GCP PCS was born out of them. This GCP PCS is based on many of the technical things which have been uh, adopted in that. And my uh, colleague who is a member of the technical committee, Dr. Sanish Davis, he will speak about the minimum standard of competence which encompasses all the things which we have mentioned here. I spoke about the genesis about it and it's very important for us to know that uh, this is based on a very strong structure. Nothing existed before this. See, THSTI became the scheme owner, and we have multi-stakeholder committees, which I will speak in my next slides. We focused on two areas, which are training and professionals. If somebody is already trained in GCP and do not feel the requirement to train themselves, they can directly go to PRCBs, which are professional certification bodies. We have one with us, which is NECU, Northeastern Christian University. You can directly go to them, give the examinations or competency assessment, and become GCP. PCS certified. If you feel that you lack training, then you should approach few of the GCP institutes which are training. We do not have presently any one of them, but today only we have been signing a document or a mem memorandum of understanding with the National Institute of Health and Family Welfare. And slowly we will uh, come out with NIHFW working towards that. Certifications are of two types, which I say main to certify personnel because it's a personal certification and to support if people are not trained or they're not confident about to support that's a training institutions. When the scheme was launched, there were a lot of activities, a lot of brainstorming sessions. And when the draft of minimum standard of competence was uh, uploaded, it was there was a lot of public comments that was invited and we received national as well as a lot of international public comments. This was dedicated to nation on 15th August and our honorable secretary then Dr. Dr. Renu Surubji um, has launched this and dedicated to the nation. You can see our colleagues on the dais when it was dedicated to the nation at the THST Auditorium. And it was a great uh, achievement because we always are, as an Indians, we are very good followers. But this GCP PCS makes us the leaders because when we have launched it's a first, let the world follow this. And when uh, we wanted to do this, we never wanted to do this, actually, because government wants to do good governance and not do many things which are very tough for us to do. But we felt nothing existed. So somebody has to do that. So THST has taken the onus to create a benchmark for the good clinical practice professionals and developed a framework based on core competence and standardized to enhance the quality.
In Indian scenario, we find there are various such schemes. Some are regulated, like in drugs for the, we all know our CDSU, Central Drug Standard Control Organization, Food, FSSI, Insurance, EDA, Telecom, TRI. There are many voluntary schemes, for example, uh, for good agriculture practice schemes. There are a lot of other schemes, like we have in laboratories, the NABL, hospitals, the NABH. So this scheme is a voluntary scheme, which is based on the same standard set of things which was done for even yoga certification board. Before doing that, we did a lot of uh, SWOT analysis at our end to find out, are we qualified to do that? Are we competent to do that? Are we strengthened by people to do that? And I, we felt that if nobody is there, I think we should be the first one to be the most strongest to do that. Otherwise, other, could have, other people could have done. We did not find in our survey across globe that there is any other system which exists. That's why we claim that this is first of its kind. If you know any scheme which is based on this which has been launched before us, we'd love to hear from you. It is based on an international personal certification standard called ISO 17002 2012. And THSTR organization is the scheme owner. All the details are available in the website. Few days ago on 2nd November, exactly less than a month ago, we met the present drugs, uh, DCGI, Drugs Controller General of India, Dr. Raghuvanshi Ji, and we mentioned about the GCPPCS to him. He was delighted, he, he was supportive, and we also mentioned the revision of the CDSO GCP 2001 because it is 22 years old. And I'm sure that the regulators are working hard, probably harder to ensure that that GCP also gets <clears throat> revised soon. GCP PCS is based on core competency. To us, core competency means knowledge, skill, and the attitude of the person who are performing the skill. The entire minimum standard of competence, when you hear, you'll understand it's very technical in nature and is based on core competency. This structure is very interesting and important. Many of us are now not aware about it. THSTI being the scheme owner has two parts, which is personal certification bodies, which NICO is the first PRCB in India for us, maybe globally. <clears throat> and anybody who wants to take GCP PCS certification can directly walk into NICO and they can directly take. We have no interference to that. We have we have uh, already designated them as our PRCB. Training institutions are not been designated. If any one of you are running GCP courses, training courses, and you're interested in uh, being one of the training institutions of the GCP PCS, we'd love to hear from you. You can please write to us. Dr. Sonia Moore is the program officer, and she would love to interact with you to ensure that is addressed. CDSA is going to play a role in approving this PRCBs and TIs. This process is strengthened with Q NABCB QCI, National Accreditation Board for certification bodies. The former CEO, uh, Sri Anil Jauriji, is with us, who was the first originator of this thought of why not we started at THSTI. And I would like to thank him because he not only chairs the steering committee of the GCPPCS, he stands strong and tall with us to ensure that this is done. NABCB is also uh, has an MRA, Mutual Recognition Arrangement, with IAF, International Accreditation Forum, which makes it very, very strong, probably the only one in India to do that. So when you are GCPPC is certified in India, you are also recognized in Canada, Japan, Singapore, Taiwan, you name the country and we are there. Remember that GCPPC is not born in a kitchen. It's born out of huge efforts by hundreds of people. We have a steering committee, which is chaired by Shianil Jauriji, who was a former CEO of NABCB QCI and a BIS person. Technical committee, which is chaired by Professor Y.K. Gupta ji. The assessment committee, which is chaired by Krish. You will hear from them, all of them. We have a review and decision panel, and we have an appellate authority. This all structure is a very, very stringent and very strong stakeholders uh, structure. I spoke about NABCB, the International Accreditation Forum, and uh, how it is strengthened and makes us all internationally equivalent. We also want to tell you that this international standard, which we use it for our minimum standard of competence is based on the ICH E6R2 presently. When it moves to R3, will become R3. It's also based on the Indian GCP. And there are many other factors which my colleague, Dr. Sanish will take you through and the standard on which it is based. I've spoken about the strong governance structure in the slides. All the documents are available publicly in the website. You can visit that. This is a scheme owner's photograph or the logo, skill up and stand out. If you want to be winner in this today's race, India being the most populous country in the world, you need to make yourself different. You need to find out what is your unique selling proposition. 
how are you different i think skilling up will make you really stand out thank you so much for your uh, patience hearing and namaskar and jai hind thank you so much ma'am thank you for the wonderful session now we should move we should proceed further with dr sanish he'll be taking msc minimum standard for competence Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sonia, and uh, also Dr. Sujeta and others for the uh, invite. And and this is actually a culmination of several years of uh, now. <laughs> you could say starting, and then uh, you could say coming stronger again. So uh, I know we we would actually want to have some questions probably also towards the end of my presentation. So on behalf of the technical committee, uh, I. have a great pleasure in presenting the minimum standards of competence that has been defined you heard about how uh, uh, you could say gcp pcs came into being obviously the linchpin of this whole certification scheme is the testing of your competence right so uh, this was developed by cdsc earlier and um, now under the uh, umbrella of thsti uh, we had a first version which came out in 2020 quickly we uh you could say came into version 1.1 in 2021 uh, and i'm sure that over a period of time we will continue to update this based on changes that are happening so gcp as we all know is a international standard for all clinical research that is conducted globally uh and it encompasses the design the conduct the performance monitoring auditing and all the way up to reporting of the clinical research uh within india now uh, way back in i think uh, in 2003 2004 the dtab under the drugs and cosmetic act had endorsed the adoption of gcp guidelines for streamlining clinical studies in india it's also adopted by the iso standards uh, committee uh, and what we actually uh, have heard from both uh, dr yk gupta as well as sujaita is that uh within india while we are uh, being part of ic gcp etc way back in 1997 1998 uh, we still don't have a standard as to say that what what should be the standard that should be followed by a professional who is either trained or certified uh and and it also means that within india we have a lot of folks who are newly qualified as professionals within the area of clinical research there's no formal curriculum that is there in either the medical training pharmacy pharmacy training nursing training etc which talks about clinical research what is the skills that needs to be done majority of this training actually happened after the basic uh, you could say skills as a medical professional or a pharmacy professional or a nursing professional actually uh, attains so that's the reason why competence in clinical research is sometimes very difficult to actually quantify and hence you need to actually split it into the skills the knowledge and the applications of the competence of the clinical research domain needs to be looked at and and just like any testing process since these competence competencies are observable they can also be quantified and also assessed to ensure that they are really imbibed by the professional uh, who was kind of got trained in this so globally uh, there is no generally agreed set upon uh, uh, core competencies that are there under the educational and training programs uh, and and this is all the more so for professionals who have been in this area for a long time uh, so how do we define that that professional is current etc so that's how the scheme actually came out uh, this is uh, designed to evaluate and certify in a self directed practice based learning rather than supervised training uh there could be people who are coming into this as a new professional there are also professionals who would be in the mid career stage whether in academia or in the industry and there could also be people who are really well experienced in doing clinical research but are they current with with the understanding of the you could say the regulations as well as guidelines that are there so the scheme is also envisaged to promote maintain and develop competencies which is professionalism knowledge skill and attributes of the individual professional it encourages the applicants to plan record and reflect on professional development and their requirements so something similar to a continuing medical or pharmacy or nursing education so you need to continue to learn 
rather than say that, okay, you were trained several years back and that's the knowledge that you continue to have. So that's when the scheme owners developed the MSc or the minimum standard of competence. We, we believe that we would be moving into the uh, certification process, which would actually give somebody who has cleared the competency requirements to have a certificate which states that they are trained in the basic uh, GCP uh, requirements. So what are the competence domains uh, against which uh, an individual will be assessed? So we defined a set of six core competency domains for a professional in research, which, which include protocol and its, all its elements and other requirements. Uh, details about the investigational drug or the product, as we say, what are the regulations which are around that, what are the ethical considerations for patient safety and well-being. And this is probably the, the core of, you could say, the GCP professional basic certification, uh, uh, knowledge about clinical study operations and how studies are conducted, study and site management, especially important for those who are in academia, in the research site, uh, doing a great job. And of course, uh, um, you could say part and parcel of this is data management and biostatistics and medical writing and all those, uh, you could say, services which are part of uh, the clinical research. Going through each of these core uh, domains, uh, not in great detail, uh, but if you look at uh, the protocol itself, uh, it contains uh, how do you actually define what is a primary and secondary objective, the rationale for doing this, uh, doing the research, what are endpoints or objectives, and, and the expected outcome that you're assessing, uh, identifying what is a clinically important question when you actually design a protocol, uh, define what are some of the key elements, the stats, the epidemiological operational parts of the protocol, demonstrate knowledge about a, a little bit of pathophysiology, pharmacology, toxicology, et cetera, which are related to the protocol, because all of that has a bearing on understanding on the study as well as executing the study. Um, knowledge about uh, this competency, which is on investigational product development and regulation, pretty much encompasses, uh, you could say, what is the role of the different stakeholders uh, with regards to the IP? right from when the investigational product is uh, produced uh, in a manufacturing site, when it is shipped, when it reaches the site, and when it is used by the patient, when it is retrieved back, and then ultimately when it is destructed or retained at the site. So it encompasses from uh, the production until the destruction or the retention activities. Uh, and of course, uh, key to this is understanding what are the current regulatory requirements, especially in India with regards to NDCT rules, uh, as well as other guidelines which actually look at it. And also key to this is the safety reporting requirements of the country, uh, uh, how 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 it should be done, what are the workflows, what are the regulations around that. The third competency is the ethical considerations for patient safety and well-being. Uh, we, we look at what are some of the ethical underpinnings of the regulations as well as the guidelines. Uh, how do you ensure, uh, you could say, the concepts of clinical equipoise and therapeutic misconception, which is related to clinical research. And then, of course, uh, all these other ones which have uh, underpinning within the ethical aspects of uh, doing studies, including uh, audio-video recording of informed consent, which is uh, very specific to India, vulnerable population, uh, what are the different elements of the informed consent, how do you actually look at it, reimbursement, compensation, et cetera, which are all there. The fourth domain is on clinical study operations, which is a very operational part of doing a study. I mean, it is not just the pharmaceutical industry research we are talking about, but even research which happens in academia, uh, that is within the medical institutions, et cetera. How do you ensure uh, these compliance? How do you ensure safety management and handling of the product? Uh, and, and of course, uh, understanding how a study can be operationalized. If, if somebody in the institution is the investigator as well as the sponsor for the study, what are the roles and responsibilities? What, what, what needs to be monitored? So if, if it is a pharmaceutical industry study, then there is a, a monitor which is sent by the sponsor. What are the roles and responsibilities? How do you manage an audit or an inspection? 
and then post marketing which is very specific uh, for a product which is newly launched uh, also more important is also to understand uh, uh, how all these resources play for a, you could say doing a study at a site so it could be human resources uh, what are the infrastructure needed what are the financial obligations insurance all these things are covered under this particular domain uh, uh, there are there are also uh, concepts related to clinical project management which are uh, important for a gcp professional to learn what are the legal issues what are the liabilities uh, oversight management all these are pretty much operational in nature the last part of the competency is of course uh, the data management biostatistics as well as medical writing uh, while these are uh, part of any research process whether it is a thesis which is written by a uh, by a postgraduate student all the way up to pharmaceutical industry studies where large studies are conducted everything involves data management so uh, details regarding source data data entry how are queries generated on the data which is entered in uh, how do you ensure quality control correction uh, uh, what are the roles and responsibilities of different stakeholders within this domain all these are going to be part of the competency testing that is there so looking at defining the roles uh, the the technical committee realized that not everything can be uh, at a high level there could be people who are just coming into clinical research have got some training uh, do some uh, activity so we have uh, you could say uh, put the level of competence as between basic and an advanced level basic level is what we deem as an entry level requirement for functioning in any role uh, or, or any job role in clinical research for somebody who has to be uh, you could say doing lot more work say for example writing a protocol or a specialized area we believe that in the future we can have advanced level now how are these competencies evaluated so we have divided each competencies into sub competencies which mean that we want to look at uh, the attitudes and beliefs the cognitive actions which means that can you tell how do you actually write a protocol or can you say what are the different elements that you need to actually look at before you write a protocol or, or say for example ip management or investigation product management how do you ensure that the drug that is manufactured is within the gcp requirement or the gmp requirement how do you ensure the transport of the drug is appropriately done so these are different ways in which the competency can be broken down into knowledge and the skills are uh, required and we have also defined what should be the time that is required for teaching in case there are training institutes which actually implement uh, uh, these domains and and these are some of the ways in which uh, uh, if you look at the document that is there on the public domain each of the domain will have uh, for the basic level what what is the requirement of each of the sub competencies and what needs to be uh, you could say be done uh, we have extensively gone through all the reference documents that are listed here uh, which are part of uh, what is required Uh, it's also adopted from the internationally required jtf uh, framework that is used but definitely i think with iso and others we ours is the one which actually has taken care of all these elements so with that uh, i hand it over to back to sonia uh, happy to have any questions if you have time sir uh, many thanks for the session uh, we have a q and a around 4:30 to 4:50 sure that, that time we will uh, enter the questions and we will answer it accordingly uh, now it, uh, it's the time to start the session with uh, major nk deep sir so can you hear me yeah yeah i can hear you so sure sir uh, so shall i start your presentation on my end no no i i think i should be able to do it okay okay no problem if it has a problem then i will tell you uh, okay. just give me a minute Okay, share sir. screen uh, where is it so sir will be taking the session on criteria for provisional approval of gcp training institutions uh i think uh, no this is not the one we want 
I have this over here. How do I go to share screen? Sir, at the and there is a yeah, there is a down, there is a green color button which is no, no, I have that. I, I have the center green color button. Itself, yeah. When I go to share screen, then I go to my laptop. Yeah, through your presentation. I can't see my presentation. You may be having number of files open in your computer. Oh, yes, yeah, that's true. I think I should close the file, is it? Oh, yeah, number of files. Give me a minute, sir. This is... Otherwise, uh, Sonia can start sharing and you can start Yes, speaking. yes. If, if there's anything like that, I can do. Just a minute. Sonia, I'll, if I can't manage it, then I'll depend upon you. Give me a minute, please. Okay, sir. Okay. Now, let's see if I have this on. Now, if I have... My apologies to all the participants there. Yeah, uh, I, I will just ask all the participants uh, that just since, since we are waiting for that. Uh, no, if, I have, if you... I, I, no, I'm done. Okay, okay. You can, can keep posting the now? questions. Yes, sir. Is, you can start. Is it okay? Okay. Um, full screen, full screen good afternoon, mode, ladies and gentlemen. Full, full screen mode, sir. Full screen, full screen mode. mode. I put it over here. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to share with you the criteria for provisional approval of GCP training institutions. And uh, let me first start with what is criteria? Criteria is plural of a word called criterion, which stands for a standard that is used to make a decision about something. In this case, decision is about deciding about the provisional approval of a training institution. Let me share it with you all. All the criteria that has been made is based on sound principles and concepts. And it has been evolved over a period of time in an iterative and participative manner through a consensus mode. Everyone has agreed on this, all the interested parties who are part of it. So let me start with from the very beginning. Have you ever wondered why do organizations come into being? The simplest answer perhaps would be to satisfy a given societal need. If that be so, why have the TIs come into being? They are also satisfying a societal need of training the clinical professionals. Now, what is their organizational process? The organizational process is every training institution or any organization would have an aspiration, a given vision, what they want to do, achieve. Then they come around to say, what business we are in, how do you want to achieve it? That is their mission. Then by a dynamic interplay of three things, that is resources, technology, and what I call triple S, system, structure, and strategy, they go about achieving their goals and targets. In doing so, they are influenced by the external environment. And if we had to discuss and find out what is the external environment about in today's scenario, one thing stands out loud and clear, rapid changes. You would say change has always been there, of course. But the degree and rapidity of change that we are facing today, our ancestors didn't face so. And chances are, our coming generations will be confronted with a far greater change. This change can manifest in the form of technology obsolescence, which is so clear today. And what is globalization? I have a somewhat of a flippant statement to say, which explains globalization. It is the story of a British princess who along with her Egyptian born friend was traveling in a German made car on the streets of Paris in France, driven by a Dutch chauffeur who had consumed alcohol or whiskey made in Scotland. They were chased by Italian paparazzi who were riding a mobile made in Japan before they met with an accident. Even an American doctor attended to her and gave her medicines made in Brazil and Israel. Poor thing, she didn't survive, she still died. No prizes for guessing it right. It was Princess Diana. And that happened more than 20 years ago. So the globalization is a lot more today than ever before. Influence of communication, media, computer, internet, etc. Do we need to discuss it? When I ask in my training program, what is the first thing that you do when you get up? Most people say, I grab my... Guess what? Guess what? Your mobile. mobile. And there's nothing else happening in that, but that is what it is. We are operating in a world which has fierce competition. And if we are striving for excellence, you have the greatest competition with yourself. Are we doing it better than before? 
customer is hard to please. Any doubts about that? There is another saying, which is not really very, very flattering. In India, customer means kasht se mar, and that need not happen. Because customers today are very discerning, they have choices, and they are well informed. We all are customers, and we act very tough. But when we have our customer to serve, we need to be equally conscious of their requirement. High mortality rate. Yes, a lot of companies are simply disappearing. We talk about external environment. There is an internal environment also in the organization, which is typically called organizational culture. Let's define what is culture. I'm not giving any book definition. The definition that comes to my mind is simple word. Culture is bhasha, bhojan, bhajan, bhangda. That means the language you speak, the kind of food you eat, the way you pray, and the way you entertain. You don't have to go very far. In India, we are a multicultural nation, and it is so different. What you do in Kerala, you don't do in JNK. In organizational scenario, culture means shared values and beliefs. Then we talk about quality in uh, TIs, training institutions. We have a problem. Problem is that all the work was done initially about quality in manufacturing sector, and we are operating in service sector. It was only in 1980s, three gentlemen, Parsuram, Benthamel, and uh, Parsuram, Berry, and Benthamel. They did research on what was called dimensions of service quality. And they worked out following dimensions, tangibles or infrastructure, reliability, responsiveness, competence, courtesy, credibility, security, access, communication, and understanding the customer. Now you will notice knowingly and not unknowingly, for very much knowingly, all the things that we have discussed so far is actually built into the criteria. That was just to assure you, the criteria is not off the cuff. This is based on a sound research and concepts. Now I'm going to discuss with you the criteria in brief. It's a tall order to discuss in so short a while, but we'll make an effort. Salient objectives, to assess the institutions and their programs for meeting defined quality standards. And quality standards are defined in this criteria to foster excellence in the TIs and building effectiveness in delivering competency-based training, to establish a framework for continuous improvement and provide the opportunity to benchmark with other institutions. You will notice continuous improvement will keep coming over and over again because we can't freeze in frame of time and we have to move with the time ahead. To facilitate developing a professional competence of GCP professionals, to provide a basis for determining eligibility for assistant and investment of public funds by government and regulatory agency. Apparently, this is separating the horses from donkeys. That's the objective. Scope. What is scope? Scope is drawing the boundaries. I mean, the scope of this criteria is drawing boundaries that the, uh, this particular criteria refers to. I will address following things. A. This provisional criterion specifies the requirement for provisional approval of TI so that there is a need to demonstrate its ability to consistently provide competence-based GCP training that meets interested parties' requirements and facilitates overall development of training. Now, two things are important in this. One is consistent, one is demonstrate, second is consistently. Demonstrate means this is what an assessor would verify, and a training institution will have to show that, give the objective evidence for that. Consistency means not one shot of air, but throughout. It aims to enhance interested parties' satisfaction through effective application of process approach for continual improvement of the system. Now, we are drawing strength from ISO 17024. Like any quality management standard, there is a great focus on process approach. Process approach simply means all the activities that we do in an institution should be made into processes, considered as processes. A process will have an input, then the process itself will have value addition, and then there'll be output. That output could be an input for another process or be an itself. If there's no value addition, the process need not exist over there. So process approach helps us in building quality. All requirements are generic and non-prescriptive intended to supply to apply to all institutions regardless of their size, type, nature of training provided, etc. It provides the framework to, now there are five words over here, they are, which are important, plan, establish, operate, monitor, and improve. 
Now, this criteria enables a tra uh, training institution to do all these four things because these are mentioned as a requirement and improve GCB professional training services. Service. Institutions may determine the extent of prescription by which they shall be governed by applicable statutory and regulatory requirements. This word statutory and regulatory comes over and over again, and I'll take a minute to define them. What is statutory? Statutory is any obligatory requir requirement spelt out or specified by a legislative body. Even a municipal corporation is a less legislative body, and if they give a requirement, it is applicable to TI. And what is regulatory? Regulatory is also a requirement specified by an authority mandated to do so by the legislative body. So in other words, both these are obligatory requirements. So there's a difference between the two. The policies and objective. Objective is the goal and policies is the broad guidelines given to make how to reach there. Resources required for effective implementation of the criteria. Obviously, you will need financial as well as human resources. Now, there are certain terms and references uh, mentioned over there, what is called glossary. Appeal. Appeal, as the name implies, is against a decision. It is typically applicable to a trainee or a participant against a decision for a to review the decision. Competence. It has been mentioned in the last uh, session as well. Ability to apply knowledge and skills to achieve intended results. Here's the catch. A guy may be competent, yet he may not apply it. So there is an element of having the appropriate kind of motivation for him. Having the, that, that, that's a potential energy that he has. To, for him to use, you need something more than that. Complaint is simply an expression of dissatisfaction. It can be by other than appeal, uh, can be by anyone. Conformity, this word will come again and again. It is fulfillment of requirements. We are spelling out requirements in this criteria. Fulfilling it, it makes the conformity. Continual improvement. Yes, I said it will come again and again. Recurring activity to enhance performance. Correct, corrective action. Action to eliminate the cause of uh, non-conformity. If a non-conformity has occurred, the corrective action is about eliminating the cause. What does it mean? We must first investigate by root cause analysis what was the cause. So we have to plug that cause. That is when it becomes a corrective action. Document is an instruction or procedure format for information and supporting medium. Example, procedure, drawing, report, standard, whatever you may have. Now, documented information is the information required to be controlled and maintained by an organization and the medium on which it is contained. It means it can be an electronic media, it can be hard copy, it can be anything else. Now, uh, documented information can be in any format. This is move on. Effectiveness. Effectiveness root is giving effect to. That means realization of results. Getting results is effectiveness. What is not being discussed over here is efficiency. Efficiency and effectiveness go together. Efficiency is output divided by input, which we learned in our school. In other words, it is the optimum utilization of resources. At time, there'll be a need for trade-off between efficiency and uh, effectiveness. Interested party, any person or organization that can affect, affect be affected by or perceive itself to be affected by decision or activity. Even the perception makes him an interested party. Management system to establish policy and objectives and to achieve those objectives. It is not only establishing, but achieving objective is the key. Monitoring, determining the status of a system or a process or an activity. Non-conformity apparently is non-fulfillment of requirements. Objective, result to be achieved. Performance is the measurable result process I have already mentioned to you is an interrelated and interacting activities which transforms input into output. Remember, there has to be an element of value addition. Quality. Quality is the degree of excellence and distinguishing nature of attributes of training program. Quality is the ongoing process of building and sustaining relationships by assessing, anticipating, and fulfilling stated and implied needs is the customer's perception of the value of the supplier's work output. These definitions are specific to these criteria. But the standard definition of quality is this, which is given in ISO 9000 uh, standard. Degree to which the set of inherent characteristics fulfill requirements. Though not given in the standard, uh, in our criteria, I have purposely mentioned it because there is a mention of requirements and very soon we'll be discussing the requirements. 
Record is a document restating results achieved or providing evidence of activities performed. Record is a historic evidence. Record is you cannot alter. A document you can alter. Now here comes the requirement, which I was wanting to mention. Need or expectation that is stated generally, implied or obligatory. Now what's the difference between need and expectation? Now imagine you have gone on a uh, wintry day on a roadside and you want a cup of tea. You walk into a dhaba and you want a hot cup of tea. So your need is having a hot cup of tea. But your expectation is that it should be close to 100 degrees Celsius, that is almost boiling. It should be given in a clean cup of cup or a mug, that means not chipped or dirty. There should be no dead or living fly or cockroach in it. The waiter should not put his finger into it. You don't state it. So requirement, expectations are implied needs. They are requirements too. So needs are stated, expectations are not stated. Even in the TI case, the stated need is to get certified for as a, a practitioner. But there's an implied need to be, employ be employable. That's why there's one of a clause in this standard, uh, this criteria given to attend to that. Scheme owner, we've discussed training, training institution, training process. We will skip that. Now we come to the criteria. First one is general. Now, when we look at the criteria, we should see two points of view. What is its intent and what is expected from the training institution? Now, managing committee of the TI shall establish and maintain a documented training management system and continually improve its effectiveness in accordance with the requirement of these criteria. Now, what is meant is there has to be a management committee. There has to be a documented uh, training management system. And that system will build up gradually once you fulfill the requirements given in this criteria. Next is leadership. Management committee shall establish and follow uh, methods to determine the needs and expectation concerning effective delivery of curriculum and varied development of trainees. Requirement is that management committee which has been established has to have methodology for determining the needs and expectation. Responsibility and authority. It is simple. TI shall define and document the responsibility authorities of key personnel. This is doable and not complicated. Infrastructure. The TI shall have trainers with appropriate educational qualifications, experience, and training, adequate and appropriate support staff and facilities to conduct training programs. Frankly, this particular clause is not exactly infrastructure. This comes in either in the infrastructure, the human resources, or we have a separate clause, clause over here talking about the competence of the trainer. The TI shall provide conditions to facilitate learning environment, which shall include office, safe classroom, clinics, laboratories. These are only illustrative. If there is needed something more than that, TI is expected to have that. And the classroom, etc., should be clean, ventilated, and safe from the weather, weather condition. Control of documents and control of record, they go together. So really speaking, we have discussed what is document and what is record. Institution shall establish a documented procedure for preparing, reviewing, and approving internal documents. In other words, control of documents, and similarly for control of record, there has to be a documented procedure laid down. And what will it include? As is given in the record the side, uh, it is given a documented procedure shall establish to define providing identification. These are the aspects. Identification, indexing, storage, retention time, and disposal. All these will be laid down. Unique identity, how it will be done. Idea is it should be retrievable, usable, and kept, and at an appropriate time, got rid of. Financial resources. TI shall provide financial resources that shall be capable of sustaining a sound training program consistent with its mission and objectives for long-term stability. All that it means is that organization should demonstrate that it has adequate resources. It could be in the form of some FDs, some in, uh, the, the, the loans it may have taken, or basically the requirement would be to see whether they have adequate working capital or not. Investments are already made. So your assessor will be looking to have a look at that. Compliance to statutory and regulatory requirements. We've already talked about statutory and regulatory. You are required to identify. Here you notice the word used is compliance. Compliance is to statutory and regulatory requirement. Conformity or conformance is to the criteria. Learning service requirements. Communication. Training institutions shall notify the trainees through appropriate means about the syllabus fees and commitment required for the training 
to complete the training. The onus is on the TI to notify to the training through appropriate means. It can be in the form of a web website or a brochure or notice board or in the joining instruction. Admission process shall be, there shall be policy and procedure for admission of trainees, including policy on concession. If you want to give some concession on the fee, it will be made public and clear, made available to the candidate. TI shall provide information on its policies and program, the responsibility of trainees during the training, conduct discipline, attendance norms, and financial obligation on the part of training. All this is meant to be known to the candidates who become a students or the training. So this should know before, during, at the admission procedure or process. Provision of learning services. TI shall communicate to the trainee the responsibilities of the trainee, uh, TI shall ensure the availability and accessibility of training material. What does it mean? This indicates that the trainee should know what can he or she expect from the training institution. And it is made, laid down over here, that all training material will be made accessible or available to each trainee. Curriculum planning. TI shall ensure that the syllabus of their training program corresponds as a minimum with the MSc developed by uh, CDSA, THSI. We just had a session on MSc. Before I go any further, I want to clarify. We must know what is curriculum. Curriculum is not syllabus. So syllabus is part of curriculum. Classically, a curriculum, clinical planning and development and uh, delivery will include uh, syllabus, methodology of training and teaching, and evaluation. All this put together comes curriculum. Development of training program. Here it is only limited to training program. It is very interesting and it is key to the training institution's activity. Once the subjects, topics, and specific modules have been decided, the TI shall develop training material, exercises, case studies, and plan for project work if they are required, if it is appropriate. It is not that you have to thrust in case study in every session that you are required. No, it will develop a course timetable and delivery of the curriculum. Course timetable should be available. The whole um, uh, training material or methodology should be available. Competency of training. Here it is laid down, like I mentioned earlier in infrastructure. Here it is specified. Competency criteria is postgraduate degree in medical sciences, nursing, pharmaceutical, biological sciences. <clears throat> or biostatistic clinical data management. Five years of work experience in clinical research after receiving postgraduate degree. GCP trained, the team of personnel, that is evaluator, trainer, or question paper setter, etc., to have overall collective competence of six domains, which was mentioned in the last session. Institution shall review the performance of the trainers annually and take adequate measures to upgrade their competence. How would they do it? Not prescribed. It is your choice, the TI's choice. It could be by peer evaluation. It could be witnessing by another person. It could be based on feedback. But there has to be an evidence that you are reviewing the performance of the trainer annually. You can do it oftener than that. But adequate measure to upgrade their competence does not mean there's necessity. You have to first establish necessity of upgrading. If there is no necessity, you have reviewed and said it is okay, not required to be done. Continuous evaluation. Here is the continuation evaluation of the trainees. Why? They have to be given feedback all along so that they have an opportunity to improve and achieve the desired standard. It shall review the result of every batch of training. Now, one is continuous evaluation of the students or the trainees. Second is you evaluate, review the results of every batch of training. Trainee development. Now, this is what I was mentioning earlier, that the expectation is the TI shall have a module on soft skills on training programs to encourage trainees to develop necessary soft skills and attitude to enable them to get suitable placement as GCP professionals. I'm pausing for 30 seconds. Why? Because it is generally said soft skills can be training. Karado. But bear with me, soft is hard and hard is soft. It is very easy to give the hard core training, but soft skill training is hard and assessing its results is even harder. Training methodology. Again, it has come out. You know, curriculum is unfolding over here. To make the transfer of knowledge and sales effective, appropriate MSc topic-specific training methodology shall be adopted. A typical cycle of explaining, demonstrating, imitating, feedback, 
practice and evaluate. This is called a DIPA. And I remember it was when, when this program was being made, I was very keen that it should be mentioned over there. Problem solving result, the related input shall be followed. Where necessary, use of case studies, experiential learning shall be resorted to. Training method should include knowledge base to facilitate understanding and concept, skill based session, application of knowledge and skill in practical knowledge. Now, here is a clause which is specific to online training. If the requirement is of online training, for that it is built in over here. The student strength shall be restricted to 25 only. Students shall be informed before registration about the system and bandwidth requirement. There's a technological aspect. Training institutions shall have adequate bandwidth for entire class and be conducted on audio and video. Faculty be supported by an assistant who can look forward to students' gap and question and provide to the main faculty. Entire class will be live and not pre-recorded. The session will be recorded and stored for a minimum of one certificate cycle. The duration of each session may be increased by 10% compared to the hours where defined by MSc document. This is to ensure differential levels of comfort candidates with such session. Training will be a minimum duration as specified in scheme criteria. The TI shall review the feedback and results of every training and take appropriate corrective action. Remember, wherever corrective action is mentioned, there has to be an established need, a non-conformity or a requirement. Feedback. TI shall obtain feedback from the trainees and take necessary corrective action. Performance measurement and improvement. General. The TI shall periodically monitor and measure the effectiveness of training and support processes as required in the respective clauses of the standard. If you notice, all along in the clauses, they have been mentioned of monitor and measure. So here it is a mention of that. TI shall identify suitable indicators to monitor and measure its performance. TI shall regularly assess the effectiveness of training. It shall implement suitable corrective and preventive action at various levels. This is part of continuous improvement. TI shall ensure effective management, collection, validation, and analysis of data to monitor the TI's performance as well as the satisfaction of interested parties. Where possible, the institution shall collect, share data with other institutions and benchmark with its data to improve upon the deficient areas. There could always be gap which it can learn from others. Management review. Management should review the following at least annually for effectiveness and conformity. Action outstanding from previous management review meetings, action resulting from external audits, administrative procedures, curriculum design and presentation, performance of trainers and future training, complaints and appeals, analysis of training or results and feedbacks, now, how, what evidence you will give? A fun thing is that training institution should have practice of management review once in a year, where at least these things and any other else that you feel uh, right would be part of agenda. There would be a um, uh, meeting notice, there will be agenda and minutes recorded. That will be an objective evidence provided to everyone that management review, at least for these things, has been carried out. Corrective action. Established procedure, there shall be established procedures for the identification and management of non conformities in its operation. There shall be necessary correction and corrective actions to eliminate the causes of non conformity to prevent a recurrence. Correction is immediate action to plug that non conformity. Corrective action is based on a root cause analysis, it goes deep. Preventive action is to make sure identify potential such problems anywhere else in the organization. Complaints and appeals, there is a requirement of having a procedure for them. So every transit, uh, training institution should have a laid down procedure of complaint handling and appeal handling. Complaint and appeal we have mentioned, discussed earlier. Okay. What I have shared with you and brief is the criteria which is laid down for the GCP training institutions. Now, this is the minimum requirement. This is doable. And for that, I suggest any training institution that wants to seek approval should study these criteria, get their clarity, what is the expectation from them, and then work on it. I wish you all the luck and God bless you. Thank you so much. I'm done. Thank you so much for the session, sir. Thank you so much on time. And uh, now I invite Dr. Devjani, ma'am, to proceed further.
with a session on assessment process for provisional approval of training institutions. Ma'am, can you hear me? Hello. You will have to unmute them. Can I request the host to unmute? Because yeah. I think from her and she's not able to unmute. Yeah, she's, I'm able to understand. Okay. In meantime, when she gets unmuted, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, we have a question yeah. answer session. Post to that, Dr. Sonia will collect all the questions yeah. and ensure that we address. Uh, Sonia, please remind to call Dr. Professor Y.K. Guptaji if he can make it. Uh, Dr. Sanish is actually not in country. It's very early morning for him, but I, yeah. I'm happy that he's able to join and stay back. Yeah. Dr. Devjani, I think you're audible now. You have to speak a little louder. Yeah, thank you. And I wish thank everybody you. a very good day. And it's nice to be back with you people. And uh, I excuse myself, there's some lot of construction going around. I requested them to quite a little bit, I do not know. But already one of my laptops have gone. I'm using some other laptops. So I requested uh, Dr. Sonia to do the projections for me because yeah, there's a yeah, lot no of problem. Project. No problem. I'll do so please, it. Sonia, I need your help to project. And then... yeah, yeah, yeah. Just give me a second. I'll yeah, sure. start your presentation. Yeah. It's nice to be here and especially to speak after Major General Beer. He has made it so lively. This may be a little bit of a dryness, but it's an important part of the story as well. So thank you so much for the projection, Sonia. And it's a big help. I hope there's no noise, uh, whatever it's up help with. So again, I thank get you. started. Yeah. Please start. Can please I... start. Yeah, yeah, please start. Please start. Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. So, uh, Major General Deer has already introduced what are the criteria for any organizations who would get interested in the application and uh, uh, to start functioning as a training institute. So, the next important factor for any organization who would be interested in applying for a training institution category to run the GCPPCS training program is also good to know what is the process of assessment which would be involved after they put in the application. So this is basically what I'm going to be brief and introduce and hopefully we will come up with questions if there are some clarifications needed. So Sonia, please the next one, please. Yeah, we can skip this. And okay, we have already said this. So we are coming to good clinical practice uh, professional certification scheme. And since uh, we started, everybody has been introducing this. So therefore, there's no more uh, any necessity to introduce the scheme. And what we would be talking is that the training programs which we needed for the scheme would be run through training institutions and which would be independent bodies and they would be running the training programs and these training institutes would be set up as per the criteria already uh, discussed by the earlier speaker and uh, <clears throat> this training institutes when they come up they should be doing the training themselves and they would not be able to subcontract it for any of the portions so that is very clearly written in the scheme documents and therefore it is good to understand that any organization would do the training on its own the next one please and what is the scope the scope for the assessment to ensure that the training institutions will perform what is expected as per the scheme criteria for becoming a training institute and which is run by the scheme owner. In this case, the scheme owner is THSTI and they have to demonstrate their ability to provide the competence in the six domains which Dr. Sanish has already introduced to us and even Major General Dheer has already introduced to us. So therefore, they would be providing the 
trainings in the six domains and they should have the competency to do this as per the requirements of the training institutes. And it is not only that the training institutes would be imparting the training, but they have to satisfy the trainer's need also with, uh, uh, as General Deer has said, that there has to be continual improvement. That is a very, very important thing. So right from the application process, when the trainees apply, they come in for their trainings, and then they would be trained, and there should be continual improvement on the uh, six domains in which they would be trained. And all requirements of the training would be applied uniformly to all the training institutes, regardless of their type or size, whether they're small or big. And therefore, it is very, very important that all these scheme documents regarding the criteria of the training institutes, as well as the assessment criteria and all other documents for GCP PCS are available on the website and people can read it. The main intention of having all these documents is because then it is easier to be followed and it will be followed very uniformly across all the training institutes, particularly for this uh, uh, today's webinar, irrespective whether they are small, they're large, they have been in existence for a number of years or they have just come up. But the criteria and the uh, requirements is uniform throughout. The next one, please. So what is the focus? The focus for any training institutes who would be putting up their applications for approval that they will have a top management committee and the institution would have a very good, strong management commitment to support the training institutions requirements and the training requirements. They should have adequate infrastructure and support facilities, which are the criteria for the training institute, which has just been introduced by the previous speaker. They will design and do the development and do effective delivery of the training programs and the processes which they would be documenting. And they would be having good performance in uh, regards to their evaluation of their trainings and as I said, there should be continual improvement of these training programs based on the needs of the trainee. So training is a very, very important component of any training institution and their satisfaction is of prime importance. The next one. So what are the ones an institution get interested in applying for a training institution? They would go through the criteria, which has just been described by the previous speakers. After they put up the applications, then the applications will be scrutinized and there is a rigorous assessment uh, process. Why I say rigorous is because this is, as uh, the first speaker, Dr. Sucheta has already said, it is based on international standards and we have to have our uniformity and keep up to the good uh, practices of the international standards and therefore for the assessment of the trading institutes there are four components four components in the sense there has to be a document review that means the documents which would be submitted by the applicant training institutes would be reviewed once that there is a document review after that there is an office assessment after the office assessment, there is a witness assessment. I will go through all these different components in the next slides. And then there is an annual surveillance assessment. And in case the training institute is having multiple branches or centers from where they are imparting the trainings, the office assessment would be carried out at a sample of such sort of places. So it will be decided how many branches or centers they have and accordingly it will be decided where the office assessments would be carried out. The next slide, please. So the first component, as I said, is the document review. So once the documents for the app in support of their application is submitted to the GCP PCS Secretariat, the GCPPCS Secretariat will set up an assessment team and this team would be sent all the documents to look through and to review 
what documents have come in based on the requirements and the criteria which has been described in the scheme documents by the scheme owner. And therefore, the assessment team would look into this. The assessment team, once they have reviewed all these documented, which has been submitted by the applicant training institute, they would send the assessment team, would send their findings to the GCPPCS secretariat, and the GCPPCS secretariat in turn shall inform the applicant TI about the observations, if there are any, if there are any observations which the applicant TI would be required to look into, make some changes or make additional inputs. Therefore, they will do that. And once the training institutes, the applicant training institutes do that, then they will forward their reply addressing to all the observations or the needs that were raised by the assessment team in the document review. The GCP PCS secretariat will look through it and if it is found appropriate, if the responses by the applicant uh, training institute, the responses are found appropriate, then we can say that the document review process has been completed. So once the document review process has been completed, the training institutes would be going into what is called the next stage of assessment, which is the office assessment. In this case, I would uh, say that the assessment team, it is preferable whoever does the document review are also going for the office assessment because then they are in know of things that what they have seen in the document review and what was, if there were any gaps and how they were uh, answered to by the training institute. And now the same team would get into the office assessment process. That's the next step. Next slide, please. So now in the document review, what we have seen, what the assessment team looks at is the responsibility and the authority structure of the training institute and the documentation structure, the control of documents, the control of records, all these things have been dis uh, discussed by my previous speaker. Therefore, I'm not getting into details of it. I'm just mentioning that these are the points that the assessment team looks into during the document review. Then the document training management systems, the needs and expectations concerning effective delivery of curriculum, and development of the trainings. This also has been discussed by my previous speaker, so it makes my job more easier. And the trainer's education, training, and experience. This also, Major General Dheer has explained what are the requirements for the trainers to become eligible to train the GCPPCS uh, professionals to train them. Therefore, these are the uh, um, criteria that the assessment team looks into while doing the document review. And once they have done it, it once it has been completed, they go on to the next step. Next slide, please. So the second component is the office assessment. So what does office assessment, what is being done in this uh, step is confirmation of the findings of documents reviewed by interviewing the staff of the trading industry. This is the office assessment is usually, unless there's some COVID-like situation or other conditions, people usually go on site and therefore they interact with the staff or the trainers of the training institute. And whatever they have found during the document review, they like to see whether these are all the same, whatever was written down. Then the assessment and review of, again, the control documents and the control records. The compliance with the statutory and regulatory requirements, which my previous speakers have already, Sucheta has defined what, is the, what are the regulatory requirements, what are the statutory requirements. In this case, this is a voluntary system. Again, we have the requirements defined in the scheme documents and therefore the assessment team would look into the compliance of all these requirements and these should be in the documented format of the training institute's uh, documents. Then the uh, assessment of admission process, how the trainees are being admitted into the program, 
confirmation of the requirements to the scheme criteria, then assess the system for recruitment, training, and development of upgradation of the trainers, because trainers are the main backbone of besides other things, the training is being imparted by the trainers and therefore trainers form an important component. So that also is being looked into. And then in general, the verification of evidence of implementation of all these documented systems. So during the office assessment, all these criteria and requirements are looked into by the assessment team, usually going on site, but in case of COVID-like situation, it can also happen online. And the requirements for online has been also described by my previous speaker. So can we go on to the next slide, please? So again, during this time, this is actually a repeat and my previous speaker has already uh, talked about this. I just go through it very quickly. What is the competence of the trainers? That is, they, we have described in the scheme documents what are the requirements, what should be their education background, what should be their work experience, they should be GCP trained, and all the personnel who either act as evaluators, trainers, or even question paper setters, what all the competence that would be required, and especially during when uh, Dr. Davis was talking, he has defined and explained very clearly what are the six domains and what are the subdomains and how they to go about it. So all these people, the evaluators, trainers, question paper setters, the assessment team will judge whether they have the competence to deal overall with all these six domains which are required for any training institution for the GCP PCS. The next slide, please. So again, this uh, during the office assessment, the learning environment is checked, which also includes uh, the offices, the safe classrooms, the clinics, laboratories, the common space and other facilities. It was already given, they would have already, the assessment team would have already seen during the document review, but here it is a on-site, once more they check into things, whether there's adequate illumination, adequate ventilation, housekeeping, cleaning, safeguard against excessive weather conditions, and all these have been documented. And now they come on site and they look whether all these criteria and requirements are being met for the training institutes. The next one, please. After this, after the office assessment has been done, and if there are any uh, non-conformities or any, any issues, and that needs to be resolved, that will, the GCP PCS Secretariat would write to the assessment team, would come back and give the report to the Secretariat. The, if there's anything, the Secretariat would communicate with the training institutes, and there is a time frame that the training institute would look into that. And as uh, Major General Dheer has already said, there would be some corrective actions, corrections, root cause analysis, and all that. That process goes on. And once you're satisfied with those, then comes the witness assessment, because this is a training institute application. And we have to look at how the training is being imparted, and therefore, the team goes to witness a training program, how a training program is being conducted. So the witness happens and they evaluate all the aspects of the training programs, including the competence of the trainers and conformity to the applicable scheme criteria. The applicant's procedure, whatever they have put down in uh, their documentation about the delivery of the program, the appropriateness of the trainers, how the process of trading, all other things are actually looked into during the witness assessment. And it is just to see whatever has been written down, documented, whatever has been observed also during the office assessment on site to witness a training program is also very, very important. And this is the witness assessment. And once the witness assessment is over, if there are any uh, non-conformities during the witness assessment also, they need to be dealt with. And once all these are uh, closed or they have uh, been responded to, there after that, 
a provisional approval is given to the um, training institute. The next slide, please. So that is what I said. Once the office assessment has been done, once the witness assessment has been done, all if there are at all any non-conformities raised, the GCP PCS secretariat interacts with the applicant training institutes and they give their responses, the root cause analysis, the corrective actions, or if at all the corrections they would like to make. And then the assessment team reviews that, looks into it, and if they are satisfied, everything is closed. Then a provisional approval is granted by the scheme owners. In this case, for GCP PCS, the scheme owners is THT STI, and after they give the approval, they also, the training institute is also pays the requisite fees for getting approved as a training institute, the provisional approval. And this provisional approval, the validity is for three years. And during this three years period, there are yearly surveillance and witness assessment which is mandatorily and it is uh, to be conducted yearly. And if there are any complaints or if there's other situations arising, there may be surprise assessments also at a short notice and it will be decided by the scheme owners. And when the provisional approval, which is usually for three years for training institutes is uh, about to expire, then uh, Mm, information goes from the GCP PCS secretariat regarding the expiry of the approval of the validity. And then they, if they want, if they're satisfied, they can apply for a formally full approval with the full criteria in time so that before the total expiry of the three years, they can move on to the next higher level of getting accredited. The next one, please. Next slide. Yeah. So this is the surveillance assessment. As I said, once the, the trading institute get their approval, the provisional approval for three years, then the cycle of yearly surveillance starts. And this yearly surveillance is basically to see that the training institutes are complying to the scheme criteria and the requirements, and they are effectively implementing it as per their documented procedure. The scheme owners also reserve the right, as I said, even for the earlier uh, case, to carry out short notice assessments at short notice if there are any complaints or concerns raised against the administration of the program by any complainant. And the cost for the same shall be borne by the training institute. So this is in general what is meant by surveillance assessment and that's a yearly affair. The next slide, please. And uh, in case there are certain issues, there could be a suspension of the approval. And usually the training institute will be served a show cause notice giving 15 days to response respond to whatever the uh, complaints are for and they can uh, come up with a personal hearing before any final decision is taken and this can be this could be for any non-compliance or violation of the scheme criteria or any of the requirements which are not being fulfilled or are being done insufficiently or incorrectly Improper use of scheme logo, you all have seen in this uh, slides also, the logo for GCP PCS is there. And they have to have proper, we have prepared documents of how the logo is to be used and how the logo is to be uh, utilized at various places. So the, if there is an improper use of this logo or the mark or any changes of the format, of the logo without the approval of the scheme owner, that is also some sort of irregularity. And therefore they could be asked, given a show cause notice or any major changes in the training material or program without the approval of the scheme owner or defaulting on payment of the fees. So under any of these conditions, the training institute could be served 
a notice, a show cause notice, and of course, they will be given a chance of personal hearing before taking any final decision for any suspension. The next slide, please. Or I talked about suspension in the just this earlier slide, but there is also a condition of cancellation of approval. And that is also something similar, which is like non-compliance or violence of the scheme criteria and the requirements, providing insufficient or incorrect information, improper use of the scheme logo or certification mark. In this case, it is scheme logo and change of certification format without the scheme owner's approval. Here, the scheme owner is THSPI or major changes, failure to report any of these uh, training component or any changes that is happening and they have not informed the scheme owner or any other condition that seem to be deemed to be appropriate by the scheme owner. And as I said, again, uh, defaulting on payment of fees. So this is also, a, these are the various conditions for even cancellation of the approval. The next slide, please. And the fee structure is already available on the website. Anybody who's interested can go into this web. The web address is there and they can look up the fee structure. And uh, even the application forms are there on the website and all details, the checklist, all the details are available. So any, any organization getting interested in application uh, for uh, the status of a training institute could look into all the documents available on, on this web address. Next one, then I think I would like to thank you. And questions, any questions, any queries, all of us are there to respond to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the wonderful session. Yeah. So now we'll be starting with a QA session. So I invite all and I request all to write your questions in the message box. If you have any, any query regarding the program, any query regarding the certification, anything related to the, yeah, we have one question that time frame to register a TI under THSTI and how long, how long it will valid. Can you hear my hello? To, you will have to unmute uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Devjani, I think. Again, she got muted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. just a minute. Just a minute. Just a minute. I will request all of you to keep the questions very much uh, focused on GCP PCS. If you ask yeah. questions which Professor Kamal Sharma has asked, I yeah. think nobody other than CDSEO can answer those. So, <clears throat> Sonia, can you just repeat the question? I think the time frame that is what is being asked. Uh, Ma'am, uh, can you see the screen I have shared? Hello. Not seeing the quest. Ah, time frame. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. These are the three questions so far. Are One is by Doctor Pro. Yeah, Kamal Sharma. Kamal Sharma. The first one is not for me. The second one I can answer. Yeah, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Please, ma'am. Go ahead. I'm. I'm responding to the second question. The time frame to register a TI under THTI. I don't think so. There is a time frame. The application forms are available on the website, and all details regarding the fee structure and everything is given there. So once they fill up that, and along with the checklist, there is a checklist. What all documents are needed, so you can look into that, and you can get in touch with the GCP PCS secretariat if any additional help or information is needed beside whatever is there on the website and therefore the earlier you apply earlier the process starts and earlier the assessment happens and the various stages of assessments I have just described and once the 
provisional approval is given that is i've already said it is for three years so it is valid the provisional approval is valid for three years and just before the expiry of the three years maybe six months before the gcp pcs secretariat reminds them and they can upgrade themselves with their full criteria because they would have got their experience and expertise by then and they would move up the ladder and become fully accredited i think that's what was question for and who all can apply anybody who wants to uh, come as a training institute and you know the criteria to become the training institute and also the trainer's competence has been described very well so these are the requirements thank you ma'am one more question one more question is there please guide us Sorry. Sonia, uh, yeah. maybe I can take the first one. Yeah, uh, please, so, sir, please, sir, please. So, from a regulatory perspective, that is under the NDCT rules of 2019, there is no upper limit or cap on the multiple studies that can be done by the investigator. From a practical perspective, the investigator and the ethics committee of the institute need to make an assessment that how many of them are active studies. So, there could be studies which are in the startup where the investigators time and involvement might be less there could be some studies which are in the conduct phase which means there is high requirement of the investigator to give oversight and then there could be some studies which are in the close out phase where again the investigators requirement of providing oversight and patient care in the study might be lesser so i think it's a joint decision between the investigator and of course the ethics committee as to how many studies can be done Many a times, uh, ethics committees don't challenge this requirement. Uh, so the investigator is probably the best person to actually say that, okay, how much can you actually do by ensuring adequate oversight of the studies that you conduct? You know, I'm marking green to the answered questions. And next question is, who all can apply for the program? That's I think been, I think training, yeah. training institute. I think depending upon they fulfill the criteria and the requirement. Am I right, Sanish? Yes. What do you think? I I think you answered this question, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, one more question is there. Please guide us as how we can we can we can we as a site obtain GCP training directly from the THSTI. So I think they are they are already a training institute. The person who has asked this question is uh, Dr. Megha, Dr. Megha Jajodia. Dr. Megha has asked this question. Also, can I... you enlighten her? Again, her question is, Maybe Dr. Sanesh or Sucheta can deal with that. Yeah, maybe the second Sucheta. part of it. Yeah, the second part of it. Yeah, Sucheta, do you want to go with the first uh, first part? Uh, please guide us to how a site can obtain GCP training directly from THSTI. Yeah, Sucheta, please. I think she is frozen, I guess. Mm, yep. Okay, maybe I can take the second part, which is yeah. on... Uh, sorry, can you share the screen again? Oh, Sonia is also gone, I guess. So I think the second part of the question was, uh, how often do you need to take, uh, you could say, GCP training? Um, so the requirement is that you need to have an annual training anyways. If you're doing a clinical trial or a clinical research study, you need to be uh, having a, uh, you could say, a training done annually for everyone, including your site study coordinators, ethics committee members, etc. Uh, the duration is not prescribed anywhere. Uh, so that, and that's exact reason why the GCP PCS is important because we now have very clear guidance as to what should be the curriculum, what should be the duration of that training, etc. 
so again, we don't want to be pro prescriptive because there could be some investigators who are really experienced who have been doing studies for 20, 25, 30 years. So to tell them that, okay, you need to mandatorily uh, do a training which is uh, uh, of eight hours, et cetera, doesn't make sense. So it's more of, you could say, what is your current level of expertise and the, uh, and the body that gives you that training. So we have both training institutes uh, under the under the PCS, uh, GCP PCS uh, program, uh, as well as certification bodies. So training yeah. bodies are the ones that you certainly should approach uh, for that. Uh, if I could add on, uh, Dr. Sanish, to this, like a question like this, of course, I'm not an expert in this particular field, but if uh, people, as you said, some are very experienced and they may not need to have a training, they can directly go if they're interested for certifications to the PRCB. So that is what you said, that there are two parts to it. So one is the institution per se, an institution coming up as a training institute, but there may be individuals who do not need a training. They can go directly for certification. Yeah. So sorry, we lost the connection in between. I think we have answered. Yeah, I, I think the question from uh, uh, the, the participant was that, if a site has to directly approach yeah, yeah. the HSTI. So I don't know whether Sucheta is back online or if you can take that question, Sonia. Yeah, I'm back. Actually, we suffered from some uh, electricity failures. And yeah. we are, uh, THSTI is proudly hosting the India International Science Festival 2024 in January, and we are expecting our Honorable Prime Minister to come and a helipad is being made just next to us. So as a consequence, we are facing some of the electricity failures, and I'm sure you'll be here with us. So CDSA will have a conflict. CDSA, THSTI. CDSA is a part of THSTI, and we will have a pure conflict of interest if we start training those people and those yeah. people go to PRCVs and uh, take uh, certifications. So we will abstain from uh, training the people directly. I think Tata Memorial Hospital Mumbai uh, in February 2024 might be our last training. After that, we will uh, not uh, do GCP training. We, of course, will continue doing several other training. So uh, if you would like to obtain us uh, GCP training, I think these uh, training, GCP training providers or institutions will come into place. Uh, initially, maybe if somebody is interested and would like to uh, ch check all the tapes told today by uh, Major General Dhirji and Professor Devjani, you are interested, then THSTI can play an initial role in handholding or mentoring because we want more training institutions, not only in India, but globally. And same for the PRCVs. Dr. Sanish, what about your society? Can it undertake training it's for some time at least? Uh, ISCR again, I think we have <laughs> we have been providing training, but uh, I I think what we need to be also be clear is that uh, the training institutes which will come under the scheme, they should actually be the ones who should do that training. So yeah, the problem is, is that uh, right now, uh, if G if THSTI also does not do training and training institutions have not yet come, so we are yeah. in a vacuum. Yeah, correct. Somebody so, needs to fill up that vacuum for the time being. Yeah, that's so, that's something that we can definitely look at. So yeah. I Jauri think we can Ji, offline I... talk. We can talk offline, Sucheta, with yeah. uh, Dr. Tanish. So, Jauri Ji, I would like to tell you, as well as all the uh, attending participants, that THSTI has signed an MOU with National Institute of Health and Family Welfare, Delhi, which is the Government of India organizations. And because it's a Government of India organizations, we would like to support them for starting the GCP training initially mm -hmm. with the support team, and then they will do it uh, without any attachment to us. We do not want to be part of any uh, thing of training because once we are in a scheme owner, we would definitely will have issues of conflict of interest. But initially, yes. Yes, you would like to support so that's as many as training institutions can come up or PRCBs can come up. We'd like to support and mentor initially all. We can discuss this offline and find sure, a solution. Sir. Sure. Yeah. Sir. So any more not, no, not yet. We have not received any new questions. Okay. 
so last time also we were lucky to uh, close before uh, time i think nowadays air india uh, announces arrival of the flight 10 minutes earlier than the scheduled time at least i hear many times so i am very happy that uh, we are able to do that scheduled arrival before scheduled arrival be able to end okay. it somebody is asking dr megha is asking and a question there is one more somebody. question there is one more question yeah, yeah yeah so can you please provide a list of institutes providing government and globally certified gcp training see dr mega there might be lot of organizations who might be providing gcp training now globally when i say it becomes difficult because the current regulatory and ethical requirements in india is not same as bangladesh sri lanka and even nepal those who are very uh, you know border sharing countries so we can't even think about what is the requirement in uk as per uk mhra or in brazil as per envisa brazil so it will not hold true for us and the gcp training if you see and the minimum standard of competence if you see um, there are some comp competence requirements and very um, important technical requirements which must be filled up for that so it has to be not only a simple gcp training but a training institutes which has a capability to train people based on minimum standard of competence i will tell you that the minimum standard of competence is like our je or uh, you know neat 2024 for exam ka syllabus and now there can be many company uh, coaching classes like pace or you know byjus who can be teaching those to ensure whatever is their methodology so that the participants who take training at those place clear those je and neat yeah 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 i think that's all for the day i think we um, we are not receiving any further questions so, so we can request all of them can, who are present yeah. uh, to have the switch on their videos if it is possible i would like to thank dr sanish because it's very early morning for him still he could make it i would like to thank all uh, mm -hmm. jory ji uh, professor devjani and uh, major general dheer for making it possible also our uh, dr bhattacharya and dr vaikya gupta ji was there and yes, uh, yeah and you can take a screenshot think... of the you can take a screenshot of the all yes, uh, people's gallery view uh, and you can stop sharing the yeah yeah ma'am uh, actually i i would like to invite uh, shri jori ji for concluding okay. remarks first okay. as per our agenda and then we can thanks like we can yeah, give sure, a word sure. of thanks to all okay yeah. okay no problem no problem yeah good evening uh, Sir, everybody uh, i think sucheta already jumped the gun and thanked everybody yeah. i'm so and sorry at <laughs> the session <laughs> no doesn't matter uh, i hope uh, all those who are participating have this clarity that gcpcs has two components one it certifies individuals through independent bodies and there is one body right now neku as has been said so if you want to get certified you go to that go to neku and get yourself certified and second uh, certifying training institutions where unfortunately right now we have not certified any training institution it's a new scheme so if you need training training is support if you need training to get that competence you can go to one of the in future go to one of the certified training institutions and then go for uh, certification so these are the two components i hope uh, everybody is understood today's training was focused more on the training institutions how you can become a training institution i hope there are some among you who would like to be training institutions and get uh, approved by thsti and we would welcome you to come in and uh, uh, go through the uh, sys process uh, laid down here i hope this has been um, uh, enlightening to all of you and uh, we look forward to having some of you come up to join the scheme either as certified professionals or as <laughs> certified training institutions thank you very much thanks everybody thank you so much thank you so much sir and thank you uh, so much uh, i i would like to thank all the attendees all the and all the speakers for their knowledgeable sessions and without you all it would not have been possible special thanks to for the welcome address opening remarks dr J dr jenta sir and dr vaikya gupta sir and then uh, dr sucheta ma'am for gcp overview gcp pcs overview then i would like to thank dr sanish for m for msc minimum standard for competence and then i would like to thank dr major general d 
and Dr. Dev, Professor Devjani Roy and Jory Ji. Special thanks to all and uh, we can, uh, we would like to share one good news in a month or two. We are in conversation with one probable TI. So you can check it on our website. If uh, we, we will, we are in, in conversation to have the official documentation. And there's one thing which need to become a DI is MOU. So we can you, we can merge the MOUs in between. We can discuss if, if there's any training institution who would like to become one, one of our prospective TIs, they can contact us on the email ID. I would, I would share here in the chat box. Yeah, and I'm, I'm also sharing the PRCB link so that if there's any query regarding the PRCB also, they can go through their website also. So this is the email ID, which, which is gcppcs.cdsa at the rate thsti.res.in. Any prospective TI who, want, who are interested to shake hand with us to become one of the prospective TI, they can email us to email us to this email ID. Dr. Sucheta, uh, please, ma'am, please throw some more light on this. Uh, about this NICU? Uh, about NICU the training, yeah. The, about the Which training institution, have... about the training institutions. Those those who are interested to become our training yeah, institution, yeah. then I... can email, yeah. Yeah, they can send everybody. Uh, either you are, want to become a PRCB, either you want yes. to become a TI, or you want to become a, a GCPPCA certified professionals. The email address remains the same: gcppcs.cdsa yes. at thsti.res.in. You don't even have to remember. You have to go to our Google Swami and Google Mata and just type GCPPCS and it brings you to our website and the email address. If you find anything that uh, in our any of the documents, if you find something is wrong or you find something can be upgraded, please do not hesitate to contact us. We keep on evolving ourselves and we are continually improving every day. So please feel free to write to us. If you have missed out something, we should be doing something. We'd be very happy to do that. You know, we are always, we remember the first in the world, first in Everest, first in moon. So we have still do not have the first First in uh, GCPP is yet. We have the first applications coming into the NICU. And I will request all of you to strive and become a GCPPCS certified professionals. Not only in India, you will be valued even in every, Outside uh, every yeah. part of the globe. Yeah. Uh, so, Cheta, can I just come in? Maybe yes, you can please. Inform, inform all the audience that how yes, the scheme please. documents were developed with a lot of public comments. So, that is what is most important. None of us mentioned this in our uh, presentations. Maybe you can say that. Yeah, I did mention, Dr. Uh, Professor Devjani, I told that our documents were not uh, developed in a day. It went under, underwent huge kind of, uh, you know, discussions, deliberations, different uh, groups, a lot of stakeholders meeting. It was put for a public appeal. Uh, we had different uh, multi-stakeholder steering committee, technical committee, assessment committee, and uh, appellate authorities, decision and review decision panels. So it undergoes a huge uh, chain of sequences. And, and Dr. Sanish also showed that the MSC also underwent two sets of revisions and I am sure that it will again undergo uh, metamorphosis soon because as we can uh, continue to upgrade ourselves, change is the only thing which is constant. As it is world first, it will require changes every now and then. So we are dot at five o'clock. Uh, do you have any questions? Any of you? Anything which is coming on your mind related to GCPPCS? I can see many of us who are attending our ICMR WHO workshop yesterday has also joined. I'm very happy to see them here. Thank you so much. And if, if they are not able to comment here, they can email us their inquiries. Yeah, and sure. one more yeah. quick update I want to share here is that we will be sharing a feedback form to all the participants. Please make sure you, you fill it in with your own name because most of the participants were using were online using the the phone names so it's it is very difficult for us to you know gather the information the real names so please make sure you fill in the feedback form so that we we don't find any difficulty in making the certifications
thank you thank you all thank, thank you sir yeah. thank you okay thank then you so thank you thank you thank, thank you so you. much namaskar and jai hind thank you bye bye thank you